via sponsorship from Phyllis Healthcare, and we'd like to thank them for their continued support of applied radiology and programs like this. As a reminder, the information presented herein is that of the speaker and any findings and our data is based on work at their institution and may not be reflective of other installations and our Phillips Healthcare policy and our compliance. Now, following Dr. Slipchuk's talk, we will have time for a brief question and answer period, and we encourage you to submit questions at any time during the event. You can use the Q&A area in your webcast portal. So before we get started, I just wanted to point out some little viewing tips here. You should be seeing a screen that looks like this. As you can see where the uh, red hours are, you have the ability to increase the size of the slide area, where you would ask a question and click Submit. And finally, at the bottom there in the resource area, there are a number of links to different things, including also a link to request a demonstration from your local representative if you're so inclined. So without further ado, I'm going to now turn it over to uh, Dr. Leandro Slipchuk, who will begin his presentation. Dr. Slipchuk, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much, Kira, and I would like to thank you and, and thank uh, Applied Radiology for inviting me to give this lecture about the use of uh, cardiac imaging spectral CT and how it's ready for clinical implementation. So I uh, will talk about spectral in general, but I'll focus as well in, in chest pain. And uh, as we'll talk about spectral and all the different flavors it, come with, it, it comes from, so we can see that chest pain also comes as stable chest pain, acute chest pain, or patients that could be having an ACS. And all this will be managed a little bit differently from the imaging perspective. But also patients are different, not only uh, adult male patients have a, have an MI or have pain that is from coronary disease. You know, now the female patients have it and they should be evaluated and usually they are under-evaluated and we tend to assume the causes from chest pain are, are from a different reason. And also younger patients can have pain from coronary artery disease and in particular CT will help us to diagnose the obstructive disease, also the non-obstructive disease and in that way, tailor the therapy. And also athletes, we know from Tino O'Donnell, he had an MI while he was doing an Ironman. And so in particular, the relationship between CAD and endurance sports now is being reevaluated. And I think CT allows us to see this plaque and to see coronary disease better than just assessing it by uh, exertional capacity. So we'll be covering coronary artery disease, the importance of spectral in triple and quadruple ruled out, aortic stenosis, atrial fibrillation, and we'll talk briefly about using cardiomyopathy. Like I was saying, there's different ways to assess uh, for coronary artery disease. We can see here the percentages uh, from a paper from Patel in American Heart Journal in 2014 already. The percentage of obstructive and non-obstructive disease per different modality as compared to CT. When we do all these different modalities that are more used, we can see in the black percentages, the percentages that are used in the US of these modalities. And CT is only at 2%, but it's increasing uh, as we know the, the capabilities of the test and some more that will show with spectral. Still long, long ways to go on, on the use of uh, cardiac CT in the US. We have the new chest pain guidelines led by Dr. Gulati that uh, supported really well the use of, of CT in the diagnosis of patients with, with chest pain. Uh, the, the importance of this and the, the strength of these guidelines are I think that they don't just try to advocate one test for all. And they tell us that we should look at prior data that the patient has, even to look at a non-contrast chest CTs to see if the patient can have calcification. And we should look as well at, at the patient's age. Even that the age here doesn't come fully from guidelines from, from clinical trials, it's a recommendation that in younger patients, maybe we should favor the use of CCTA. In this way, these patients have lower chance of, of obstructive coronary disease, but higher chances that we can identify plaque that we will treat hopefully with statins, other lipid lowering medications, and potentially antiplatelets. And in that way, 
improve outcomes such as we've seen in studies like, like Scott Hart. In patients that have more chances of obstructive disease, and the older patients in particular will be going more for, for functional testing as per the guidelines. Uh, if we have patients that have a calcium score or we have a patient that had a non-gated chest CT, we should look at the at the percent that at the at the calcium score we could use Agatson that is a traditional or if it's a non-gated uh, chest CT, we could use the ordinal score. And we know that a calcium score of zero has a very good prognosis as per this uh, recent meta-analysis. But we also know that a percentage of patients that have a calcium score of zero still can have plaque. And this is about is seen about 16%, plus minus depending on the population, the age, and, and the risk factors of, of the patients. But there's a percentage that we could be missing for therapy uh, mostly. We know the chances that they will have obstructive disease is very low, but we also have the availability with CT, with contrast CCTA to visualize plaque and to in that way treat the patients appropriately. Nowadays, we can do more than just a visual assessment. There's multiple platforms and, and multiple softwares that can give us uh, from the quanti qualitative assessment of the plaque to more of a quantitative approach of the burden and quantification of the low attenuation plaque that as per data from, from Damini Day and, and Michelle Williams, we can see that in Scott Hart, uh, low attenuation plaque burden over 4% was the strongest predictor of, of events. But so what about a spectral CT? So with spectral CT, we can actually, from photons from one energy, we can use a dual layer detector uh, from, with Philips. And in that way, we can separate the energy of that photon. And in that way, get more information than with the uh, traditional CT. So with the Philips solution, the advantage is that the spectrum, the spectral imaging is always on because you have the dual layer detector. We have also other modalities with KV switching or dual source, but in these uh, modalities, we need to pre-select uh, the patients that we want to scan. This is obviously, this, this can be hard if we have a high volume center, in particular, like at Montefiore, for example, if you're imaging patients in multiple different hospitals and being them in a, in a in a core lab, and that will make it a little bit harder. So the advantage that we have this is that Spectra is always on, and then you can do the reconstructions with their software. Uh, so we eliminate this patient select dilemma, dilemma, and with the KVP switching, we also can have compromises in speed and with larger patients as well as with the dual source. There's a new new toy in the block, let's say, is there's a new CT scanner 7500 that has some advantages as compared to the ICON's uh, older scanner. Uh, this scanner is faster, it has a wider detector of 8 centimeters, so it's in particular pretty good for scanning cardiac patients. The main advantage that I was speaking before of this idea when we com compare it with conventional or with other modalities is that the spectra is always on, and we have more data that we can analyze such as with the conventional uh, CT. Uh, so we will have electron density, calcium suppression, C effective, virtual non-contrast, iodine, no water, where we can measure the concentration of iodine, and we can create mono-E's that I will describe now. So we have this rich spectral results. We can see on the left the different mono-E's, in this, the image that will be showed is uh, with the attenuation as if a single monochromatic energy was used during the scan. This is all done through post-processing. So we don't necessarily have to find the best one to scan. We can find that best one after, afterwards with the post-processing. So we can use low monoes to boost the iodine signal uh, that otherwise may be lower in patients that are either obese or patients that for different reasons ended up getting lower uh, concentration of Hounsfield units in the contrast of what we want. We can use the virtual non-contrast as, as well, that it removes the contrast and it could simulate a traditional non-contrast uh, scan. And in that way, we potentially could obviate the use and the radiation involved with this. We have the iodine water, we can quantify the iodine, we'll be talking more about this. 
can also use iodine density. We can use a effective atomic number. It's a kind of newer technique and a lot of research is being done that it has the ability to characterize structures based on the material content. We can potentially use the calcium suppression as well and an electron density. As I was saying before, we, we use the mono -E's. I think this one is particularly useful. So we can, we will be scanning at, at 120 or we can do 100 spectral content with the newer scanner as well. And we can analyze the images with lower mono -E's if we want to increase the, the contrast. But it, with this, we'll have more beam hardening artifacts. If we have metal or other artifacts that are related to metal in the in the scan we can use higher mono -E's to try to decrease the these uh, these artifacts and we can do this as we go so we can just change them on the scanner or change it in the post processing station afterwards how this is important as well if we need to scan a patient that has chronic kidney disease for example or they has a lower gfr and we decide that the ct is very important we can do the scan with lower, low radiation and also low contrast dose. And then use a lower mono -ease, like we can see of 50 here on the left. And in that way, enhance and co that contrast and, and in that way, get a diagnos diagnostic scan with as little as 30. And in some cases, you can go as little as 20 or 18, like we can see here. Obviously, this will depend a lot on the characteristics of the patient. Thinner patients, uh, smaller patients will be easier to be scanned at, uh, with lower concentrations of contrast. So this is possible. I don't think you can scan every patient with, with 20, even with the mono -ease. And in particular, younger patients that you want to decrease uh, radiation or maybe contrast if you have CKD with less amount of calcification, easier to scan with, with low contrast. We know some patients when we're evaluating, in particular when they're coming with acute chest pain, we may have the question whether the patient or the ER may have the question if the patient's having chest pain from a, from a PE, from a pulmonary embolism, or if the pain is from a cardiac origin. So in these cases, we can do a triple rule out. The problem with these triple rule outs many times is, is that the patients are having faster heart rate. And that, as we know, can lead to problems with the uh, with the RCA. So we can see here on the left that there's motion in that RCA and probably no one would say that that's a diagnostic study. In these cases, sometimes what we do is we need to reconstruct different phases or we may need to repeat the scan. The advantage with the newer scanner, the 7500, is that we have the function of precise cardiac that can do this motion correction that we can see and in that way we can salvage a scan. These scans with triple rule out uh, gating can have, uh, they usually have higher radiation. So we want to try to avoid them, uh, to re avoid repeating them at, at all costs. So we don't ir irradiate the patients too much and we can just get a diagnostic result with one scan. We can see also him similar images here where the, the RCA would have been non-diagnostic, but using precise cardiac, we can salvage the scan. And the other thing is that sometimes if you have a fellow or if you're doing the, the, if you're checking the quality of every single scan uh, while they're being acquired, this is ideal. But sometimes in certain practices, if you have too many scans be done at the same time, maybe some are missed. So in this way, uh, you can analyze them later and maybe the patient left and you realize that the scan is not as good as you wanted. So in this way, you can still utilize the scan with the precise cardiac. How does it do it? So it basically analyzes from different phases, and in that way, using picking a target phase and back projection creates a motion corrected image that will decrease uh, the motion in, in the coronary arteries. We know that this also can be important if you're trying to use myocardial perfusion imaging, if we're trying to scan triple blouse, like I mentioned, or if we're doing patients that have faster heart rates. Usually what we do here is we give patients, the outpatients, metoprol the night before the CT and the morning of the, of the scan. But sometimes you cannot do this. Maybe if the blood pressure is borderline or if it's particularly a, a small patient, frail patient, uh, you may not want to give them metoprol. Or if the baseline heart rate is already very fast from the beginning. So in this way, this can help you still image these patients. 
Another thing that is important from the from the dual energy, in particular in the triple rule out, is that we will be able to diagnose PEs and enhance that uh, the pulmonary arteries, even if the triggering was not perfect for the pulmonary arteries. Sometimes it can be hard to have a very good quality uh, pulmonary angiogram and also get the perfect timing for the coronary arteries. So we can do with the monoids, we can enhance the, the pulmonary arteries, and also we can use the conventional, the, the iodine density, or we could use the C effective like we can see. In this way, we will also be able to determine not just to see the thrombus, but we can determine the perfusion deficit that uh, will imply the severity of that clot. And this sometimes can help us to determine the implications that we'll have later and how uh, prone to treatment or how significant will be for, for that patient. This can be used also for chronic pulmonary embolisms when we can see in patients with pulmonary hypertension, for example, how uh, substantial the burden of, of clots is. And nowadays, as we can see here from data from Dr. Pontone published in, in JAK Imaging in 2020, and in particular, this modality became very uh, trendy and, and people started using it more even with, with COVID. I think the idea that not only we can do triple rule out, but with CT, we can do delayed iodine as well. And in that way, we can uh, do something similar that what we would do with with LGE, with late aluminum enhancement in cardiac MRI, we can potentially do it with CT as well. The images can be a little bit noisy, but, but you, as you can see here in this case, uh, you can see clearly in some cases, and I'll show some, some more images about this. It would also help us the, the, the dual energy to identify sometimes we're doing a case like we can see on the left that potentially there could be an obstructive artery, but we don't know sometimes if this is an artifact or this is a complete total occlusion or if, if it, this is just a, we're overcalling in the presence of a, a highly calcified lesion. And when we look at the conventional perfusion there, there's not, it's not clear that, that we see any, any deficit. I think unless you're really looking, you may miss it. But when we look at the iodine density or the C effective, this becomes a lot clearer. So the difference between normal myocardium and the underperfused myocardium is a lot more obvious. We can in this way create also dynamic color maps if we are going to be uh, using uh, CT to characterize ischemic heart disease. Potentially we could use the late iodine to show up scars as well from, from infarcts. And if we're going to be doing stress perfusion, also, the, the color maps can help a lot to identify uh, ischemia. This is still an area of research, but I think uh, more, uh, more growth in the future will be seen in this area. As we can see here, we can compare the, the in the traditional, we see the Hounsfield units, and we can compare the difference between the normal myocardium and the ischemic myocardium. But we see that when you use household units, the difference is not as much. It's, it's less than, less than it's a, the difference is less than 50%. Now let's look at the iodine content. When we quantify that iodine, we see the difference is a lot bigger. So in that way, we can identify this difference that otherwise could be missed, but also we can identify more subtle differences as well. Another finding that sometimes will change our, our management is if we use CT, and now in particular here at least, we're getting a lot more requests to use CT uh, to rule out thrombus. Sometimes patients don't want to undergo a TE, or maybe there's not enough room for TEs, or the patient is too high risk to do a TE, such in older, more frail patients. So we could potentially use CT to visualize thrombus and in patients have a stroke, for example. So in this way, spectral, as we can see here, would allow us a lot better to identify, a lot clearer at least, to identify a thrombus. And sometimes we may see it even in patients that we're not expecting to see it, or we can identify it in CT towers, for example. And this will likely change our management as a patient will need anticoagulation. Uh, we can see here that also through the use of, of spectral CT, the idea is that 
we can use lower uh, lower monoes to visualize better or higher monoes if we have more calcified plaque. Uh, in this study in particular, they found that a monoe of 100 kV was the most accurate when they compared the stenosis with the stenosis through invasive coronary angiography. So we will have at least more options. So we're not just stuck to the KV that we use to, to image the patient. Whether, you know, in, in different patients with different burdens of calcium, which one is ideal, I think, is uh, which one is perfect for that patient still needs to be determined. But it takes only seconds to switch between one and the other one. We can uh, use as well potentially dual energy CT to image patients with with stents. So I don't know how much stents you're imaging in your institution. We don't do as much here, but we do some. We do some because the patients have large stents and we want to determine if they're patent or not. And sometimes uh, we get referrals from patients that the referral doctor didn't know the patient had a CT or they're trying to evaluate the other coronary arteries, but we also want to be able to comment on the stent. And we can see here the conventional versus when we compare it to the mono E at 150 or the island no water, that this clearer visualization inside the stent. This is obviously still, I think, limited and it still needs more research. And uh, I think photon count in CT probably will help more here as well as we as we move in technology, but but certainly we can have more options than when we compare it with just the, the conventional imaging. Uh, another case is uh, in patients that have high uh, calcium score. Different institutions do this differently, and depending on the scanner that you have, uh, and we know here different, also radiologists or cardiologists practice a little bit different, but if you have a lot of calcium, sometimes you don't know if you should go ahead and scan the patient or not, if you're going to get diagnostic images. With higher mono ease here, we can make a, a, a case that otherwise with conventional CT would be non-diagnostic and we could actually see the lumen. Sometimes it's hard also because not all calcium scores are the same. If you have calcium that is more concentrated in one vessel, in one area, maybe if your radiologists have a if, if your if your radiology techs have a certain cutoffs that that you're telling them where they should scan or they shouldn't, if you just use that scan so that that cutoff, sometimes you may end up with patients that the calcium score is not that high, but it's all concentrated in one region. So in this way as well, you may be able to to salvage those scans. You can see here this patient had a calcium score over 700, more concentrated in the in the LAD. And through the use of the different monoes, we can uh, potentially still read this scan. So the patient doesn't have to be repeated, or otherwise they will have to go to a different modality, uh, which can lead problems through insurance approval, delays in, in hospital systems, and, and so forth. Another use, and this is something that we, we studied here, and uh, we published Javier Cervera, that was a visiting fellow from, from Spain. It looked at the at the Buddhist of virtual non-contrast calcium score, and he looked at the influence of the body mass index on these patients. So, usually we do the traditional the, or conventional no, uh, calcium score that is in the, needs a dedicated scan without contrast, and then we compare it with patients that had a virtual non-contrast calcium score that was uh, acquired with contrast and and. And then we remove the contrast using magic glass from, from Philips. Usually use then a, a conversion factor here. The conversion factor we found was 2.65. In that way, use this to convert the, the virtual number that you get to something comparable. And we compare it in patients with different BMIs. Those that were normal BMI, those were uh, obese, and those were, that were morbidly obese. And the correlation between the two modalities was, was actually pretty good. And we can see here the changes between the traditional non-contrast score on the left here and versus on the right. And most of them stay within the same category. The ones that are more challenging, I think the ones that have a low uh, traditional non-contrast -cal non calcium score, if it's 10 or 5, those may be missed. But the ones that are really important for the 
preventive therapies and they have the higher risk, the ones that have over 400 in particular remain within the same range. But this was a lot more accurate in patients with a normal BMI when we compared it with those that were morbidly obese. In those that were morbidly obese with BMI over 40, this still I think is not ready for, for its prime time, but it just needs more research to kind of see other ways that we could use this, this modality for, for these patients. Now we can see here the use in, in aortic stenosis also. The use of uh, TAVR is increasing all over and probably wherever you work, you're starting to read or you've been reading for a long time, uh, CT TAVR scans, that they can be challenging sometimes for different reasons. Sometimes these patients have also faster heart rates, so the use of a precise cardiac could be very good so we can evaluate the coronary arteries. Uh, we know that we're being pushed more to read coronary arteries in these patients nowadays, which can be challenging. If they have a lot of calcium, we know that most people are not giving nitro for these patients below the scan, in particular if they have critical AS. And it's also harder to give them beta blockers sometimes. So to be able to scan a faster heart rate and to be able to suppress calcium with uh, using higher mono -ease, or if the concentration of, of thiodine was lower to use lower mono -ease to to clear at least the proximal part of the arteries, I think it's very important and can save these high risk patients from needing to have a, an invasive coronary angiogram. Uh, we can see here as well how we can use this and, and the advantage in particular of the, of the 7500 is that it will be able to scan these patients at a, with a faster speed of the table so we can potentially obtain also a chest, abdomen and pelvis that, it, that is gated as we can see here. In this, in this case, we can scan at faster heart rates. We can have a better timing if we want to do the peripheral arteries. Uh, I think the, the, the worst case scenario in these patients is if you scan them, preparing them for a, for a TAVR, and then the quality of the scan is not good enough, and then they have to come back. That's obviously a big problem. And sometimes, depending on of the cardiac output of these patients, also the timing of the contrast can be, can be challenging. I think in this way, uh, it can help quite a bit. So moving to, I think another important part for, for dual energy CT is in, in patients that are being uh, imaged for uh, left atrial appendage imaging. So this could be cases where there's a workup for, uh, for a CVA. This could be cases where the patient is going to be cardioverted or this could be cases where we're doing the scan for a pulmonary vein ablation. Uh, here, Luigi DiBiase keeps us very busy with the ablations. We do a lot, so we do a lot of, a lot of scanning uh, before ablations. Uh, the advantages are obvious. So we, there was a paper from Jorge Romero, and now it's at Brigham and, and Mario Garcia from here from Monty, a meta-analysis where they look at how uh, sensitive and what's a negative predictive value and positive predictive value of, of CT. And they found that it was uh, above 92% when you compare it with TE. Obviously, the disadvantages of TE is that it's an invasive study that in some cases requires as well uh, to have an anesthesiologist if you want to be providing anesthesia. It may increase the cost and, and can lead to some complications. So if you can use CT, it's in particular better in the way that the patient doesn't go on invasive tests and in particular the patients have normal renal function. Now the problem is that many times you need to also provide a, a second CT, in particular if the first one, the, the, the first CT, you can see slow flow versus you can see thrombus. So what usually is done is a second scan, a delay scan where we can let the appendage fill. Sometimes this can be challenging as the timing may be challenging. Sometimes the timing may change patient to patient. So imaging is not always perfect. The idea is that with spectral CT, we can use iodine no water to quantify the, the content of iodine in the appendage. And in that way, there are some newer studies, mostly from, from groups from China. They have seen that we can use both the ratio between the appendage and the ascending aorta or the quantification of the of the iodine content in the appendage as to be able to determine whether this is 
uh, slow flow versus real thrombus. You can see here a case from, from here from Monty where we see the, the pre-tagger acquisition and this scan was not done for the for the appendage in particular. So if you're doing a, a case for a, for a TAVR, you're not necessarily always a, doing a, a late acquisition. So in this case, we see it was a late acquisition, but it was not perfectly timed, and, and we can see the contrast is not good enough there as to determine whether this is a low flow versus thrombus. Now, uh, when we look at the reconstructions there, this is from the first scan, it also we have more information. We can see here that the average was 0.65. So usually the numbers that we use are, uh, when we use the ratio, we use 1.3, usually as a ratio with ascending aorta, or 1.7 is are the numbers that are being studied to differentiate slow flow versus thrombus. We can see here from the late, late acquisition as well, so we can use it for the first scan, or we can use it for the late acquisition. In this case, the late acquisition was not as good, so we can use the mono ease at 55, and in that way we can visualize the thrombus maybe a little bit better. But when we use the C effective, we see this is a lot more clearer now to, to see that, that thrombus there. And we can use, there's a study that was recently published in Frontiers Cardiovascular Medicine when they do the ratios of the, of the appendage and the ascending aorta and they compare the uh, conventional versus uh, the iodine content and, and see effective. And they saw higher area uh, under the curve, so higher, uh, well, higher accuracy of this test to differentiate between thrombus and, and slow flow for the iodine content and see effective. I think this is something that, that could be very useful. Uh, and also we can use it for the first scan if we're trying to not perform a second scan, uh, that's possible. I know in some centers, for example, in, in Lyon, what we heard from, from Mark Dweck there is that they're using less of a, of a late, uh, late acquisition and then doing most of the, the studying with the, just the first scan uh, through the use of dual energy. So I think this, this could be very important and hopefully we can get patients to to be much more with CT and decrease invasive procedures and potential costs. So a lot of the images we show many times come from just the perfect case, the per so the more curated. So I wanna show you just one right from the scanner. So this was filmed with a phone and you can see the first one is hard to see exactly if there's a thrombus or not. When you go to the iodine density, it's clear there that, that you can see that thrombus. This was a, a late, delayed acquisition. So moving on, so we talked about coronary disease, we talked about uh, the use in, in aortic stenosis, we talked about the use of dual energy in uh, left atrial appendage imaging. So let's show now a case, so a little bit of a different use. This was a 25-year-old female patient that presented here to Montefiore with chest pain and a flat troponin elevation that was uh, mildly increased so we decided to do uh, a CT on this patient. We see no clear coronary artery disease, but this is enough for the, for the diagnosis of, of what the reason for this troponin elevation is in this patient. So we decided to do a delayed iodine acquisition. Here we see that it's not that clear. So the, the images from the traditional imaging for delayed iodine can be tricky. And sometimes you may not be able to fully see if there's delayed iodine or not. When we look with the C effective in this case, it's a lot more clear that there was a delayed iodine, iodine uh, in the infralateral wall in this patient. We sent for Coxsackie and the patient tested positive for Coxsackie antibodies, which obviously takes some time. So the diagnosis was done faster uh, with, the, with the CT than just, just waiting for the, for the antibodies. They didn't take three weeks, but, but it's still we were able to identify uh, this reason for the, for the chest pain, and we were able to give the patient a, a diagnosis. There was a study here uh, by the group from Lyon, also published in 2016, where they co compare the use of spectral CT in, in patients with myocarditis, and they, they compare this with, with cardiac MRI, 
So cardiac MRI still is the gold standard to image these patients. Uh, here they did 20 patients. When you look at the difference between the timing of that, that it takes for these patients, so an MRI took about 41 minutes, and with the CT it took only 50 minutes. So it takes a little bit longer because you need to do the delay, delay imaging, but still. They saw that there was a patient-based concordance of 100%. The CT has sensitivity of 100% and a segment base of 82% and still pretty low radiation. I think even that uh, MRI still has a lot, a lot of advantages to image these patients with myocarditis because we can image also edema. It's hard sometimes for uh, for hospital systems to, to be to have the availability to do inpatient MRI for many of these uh, high volume institutions. So depending on the amount of scanners you have, so CT could be also a good tool to, to image these patients. Uh, some of the disadvantages we can see here from the Lake Lewis criteria, uh, we can see that we can uh, not image myocardial edema with CT. Uh, we cannot measure also parametric mapping still but we could potentially, we can identify systolic dysfunction. Uh, we can rule out CAD that will be also very important. And we can uh, rule out significant CAD without the need to do stress in these patients. That is something that in MRI, if we want to really want to rule out obstructive CAD in these patients, we'll have to do uh, stress perfusion, which can be a little bit tricky also when you have a patient that have positive troponins and you don't know if they're having uh, active myocarditis. So I think both tests are good. I think MRI is probably better right now, but, but CT is a growing contender and potentially could be useful in, in certain different patients. To which patient this would be better, one versus the other, still needs to be determined. So we talked about the use in myocarditis as well. So now let's, let's go to another case. We have here a 61-year-old male that had history of hypertension and hyperlipidemia that presented with chest pain and shortness of breath. The patient underwent a PET scan in this case. He was an older patient and a higher probability, and the, the ordering physician decided to go with a rubidium PET, also a great test. So uh, we see some here reversibility on, on the apex. So what's the diagnosis? Maybe you can see from there but the patient kept having this chest pain and, and, and shortness of breath is the question, is this just ischemia in the, in the apex? Is this a small amount of ischemia? Should I send this patient for an invasive coronary angiogram? The decision was to have the patient go for a CT coronary angiogram. And the coronaries did not show any CAD, but what we see here that is important is also that uh, we can make the diagnosis of uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The patient had apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We can see the delayed iodine imaging on the on the right. And probably that chest pain was from, from ischemia in the area that we can see with the PET. So summarizing then a spectral CT can add significant value in the evaluation of chest pain and in the uh, treatment and evaluation treatment guiding potentially with imaging of plaque. But in imaging of coronary artery disease, but always important to treat this patient with medications that is what's really going to change the, the outcomes. Dual area detector allows for always on spectral results with the Philips platform. We have multiple spectral results that are available to pick which one suits our, our scenario better. In that way, we can create different, different uh, cards if we want to have some of these uh, spectral results come faster, but we can also adjust them to each patient to see which one we need for that patient in particular. We can salvage low contrast attenuation studies using the low mono ease, or we can use the higher mono ease to deal with contrast. Uh, with with uh, if we have too much contrast, or if we have calcium, if we have stents, if we have uh, metal artifacts we could use the high mono E or the calcium suppression. I think at least here, so, so far, we're using more the high mono E versus the calcium suppression in particular for the coronaries. I think more research needs to, needs to come in the area of, of how accurate we'll be using calcium suppression to evaluate coronary stenosis. Uh, potentially, we can use uh, the virtual non-contrast calcium score of the coronary arteries to 
obviate the need for an extra scan. As we said, this could be used in particular in patients that have normal weight or at least mild obesity in the ones that are morbidly obese, we have to be a lot more cautious with it, and I probably would not uh, utilize it as of now. And we can also enhance perfusion defects uh, using uh, or in the delay iodine with the low mono ease and using the C-effective. We talked about the, the use for, for appendage as well. So we can add value in the left atrial appendage assessment in these patients with atrial fibrillation. We can use the spectral dual energy results on the first scan. In that way, we can determine the concentration of iodine and compare it with the aorta or doing it in isolation. We can also use it in the delay scan if the contrast was not perfect, or we can use these ratios also in the delay scan. So with that, thank you very much. It's a, it's a, it takes a lot of work and it takes a, a